Fifteen years passed. Or to put it another way, Darth Vader died. So did the Emperor. The Empire fell and was succeeded by the New Republic. On the human scale, fifteen years is long enough for babies to be born and grown to teenagers. Human children across the galaxy became adults and bore children of their own. For some long-lived species, the period of time passed without significant change. For others, shorter-lived than humans, entire generations were born, grew old, and died. In a sector of the galaxy Boba Fett had never heard of, a star went supernova. It murdered a world and an entire sentient species. It aroused less comment than the destruction of Alderaan only a decade prior. The galaxy at large barely noticed the tragedy, and Fett never heard about it. In a galaxy with over 400 billion stars, over 20 million intelligent species, such things are bound to happen. The remnant of the Empire rose up against the New Republic and was defeated. Luke Skywalker fell to the dark side and returned, as few Jedi ever had in all thousands of generations preceding him. Leia Organa married on Solo, and together they had three children. On Tatooine, a drunk Devronian named Labria killed four mercenaries and vanished. Boba Fett grew older. On the planet of Coruscant, the world that had been the capital of the Old Republic and the capital of the Empire, and was now the capital of the New Republic, in the Imperial Palace, in the quarters he shared with his wife, Han Solo sat at the edge of their bed with his mouth set in an obstinate line. No, I won't go. Treaty signings bore me. And besides, that worthless son of a sloth Gareth tried to cheat me at Laro last time I was there. Leia stood with her arms folded, her exasperation showing plainly. You cheated him back. I cheated him better. Anyway, that fool should feel lucky all he had to deal with was me, Han pointed out. When I was a kid, getting caught dealing seconds was a felony, and they hung you for it. That's not true, Leia said, but a touch doubtfully, Han thought. He had known her long enough to know that cheating at cards, and the consequences of it, wasn't among the things they taught princesses. It is too true, said Han righteously. Anyway... King Gareth was lucky nothing worse happened to him than losing to me. That's the point here. So I don't know what you expect me to do. Go up to the fellow and say, I'm sorry, your scummy royal highlessness, that I cheat better than you do. Leia sighed. I wish you wouldn't use the word royal as though it were an insult. I'm... You're adopted, Han said quickly. It brought a reluctant smile to her face. You're not going to come, are you? You'd wish two weeks of diplomatic boredom on me? You sure you'd be bored? I was bored last time except for that one night. I don't think Gareth will play cards with you ever again. So I'll be bored every night. Leia sighed. <sighs> You're not coming. I'm not going. I was thinking of taking the children with me. They're old enough and it would give them some useful experience in dealing with... It's certainly safe enough, Han conceded, if they don't die of boredom. I could leave Threepio with you to keep you. You'd leave me here with Threepio? What did I do to deserve that? Leia Organa worked hard at keeping the smile off her face. All right, I'll take him with me too. Han looked up at her and grinned. Deal. She leaned in on him and whispered, You'd better not be in jail when I get back. Hey, hey, he objected. This is me. He called Luke. When Luke's image appeared in the hologram, Han said, Hey, buddy, you busy tonight? A smile lit Luke's features. Han, how are you? Fine. Look, Chewie's gone home and won't be back for another few weeks. My wife and kids are off. Right, the Shalomite trip, Luke nodded. Why didn't you go? And I was thinking, said Han, doggedly refusing to get sidetracked, we might go and see if we could dig up some trouble tonight. Luke shook his head. I can't, Han. I've invited a group of senators to dinner. You're welcome to join us, though. Trouble sounds more attractive, Han growled. Luke grinned. Come on, Han, you know I can't cancel my own dinner. 
Besides, this is Coruscant. We're two of the best-known people on the whole planet. Where are we going to find trouble? I've managed it before. And you sat in jail for two days before you convinced them you were really you. Leia was worried sick. Yeah, Han pointed out, but Leia's off-planet right now. By the time she gets back, this stay in jail will be nothing but a pleasant memory. Luke laughed. Han, come to dinner with me. You'll enjoy yourself. With half a dozen senators? I'd rather have a tooth pulled. You know, Luke said quietly, you might think about joining the Senate. Without an aesthetic, I'd rather... They'd elect you in a heartbeat and impeach me in another month. Why? Han thought about it. Bribe-taking, he said finally. He wouldn't take bribes, Luke said calmly. Well, I admit it would depend on the bribe. Han, what's bothering you? The question startled Han. Nothing. The steadiness of Luke's gaze was unsettling. You're not telling me the truth, Han. Or you're not telling yourself the truth. I'm not sure which. That look made Han uncomfortable. I don't know. Maybe it's just Chewie being gone. That's not it. Han stared at Luke. No... Not really. You know, uh, I don't know where I'm going anymore, kid. I have a wife and children who love me and who I love, but that's the problem. I'm daddy. I'm Leia's consort. I tell amusing stories at state dinners. You're very good at it, Luke said gently. There's a place for those sorts of... And somebody asked me one of those blasted dinners a while back what it was like... Smuggling, I mean. I mean, back in the old days. I started to answer, and I suddenly couldn't remember. I couldn't remember the last time I'd run an Imperial barricade, or what the cargo was, or how it felt. Luke grinned at him. The last time was me, Ben, and the droids. Han looked startled. You're right. It was, wasn't it? He smiled almost unwillingly. Yeah, all right. Let's say I couldn't remember the last time I made any money at it. Luke turned his head off pickup and turned back. Han, my guests are arriving. Are you sure you won't join us? Despite himself, Han felt tempted. Nah, not tonight. Luke nodded. I'll come by tomorrow, all right? All right. I'll talk to you later, kid. Luke's lips quirked in a small smile. Han. Yeah. Han, I'm older than you when we first met. The smile did not fade, but it changed quality subtly. In a way, Han Solo did not quite understand. The world changes, Han. You can't stop it, and you can't fight it, and you can't ever, ever turn it back. Han had the oddest impression Luke was studying him. And then Luke nodded and said, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Hang in there. His image vanished. Han Solo thought, the kid's turning into Obi-Wan right in front of my eyes. He got a recording when he tried to reach Calrissian. I'm sorry, but I can't be reached right now. Business has taken me on an extended trip. I'll respond to any messages if I return. If this is Han, buddy, you owe me 400 credits if I get back. Well, blast it, Han thought. Lando had found some trouble. Late in the evening, he found himself down at the launching bay where he kept the Falcon. It was dark except for the bay lights high above him, and quiet except for the distant sounds of cargo being unloaded in the commercial bays a good ways down. Nobody questioned Han when he arrived. Nobody asked him what he was doing there. He walked through the darkened bay as though he owned the place. And he very nearly did. Han Solo stood at the edge of the bay and laid one hand against the control for the overhead lights. And four banks of floods came to life. Beneath the wash of the light, the Millennium Falcon glowed white. She had never been so clean in all the years Han had owned her. She had never been so carefully painted and beautifully detailed. 
Her engines had been rebuilt. The new hyperdrive engines never so much as blinked. The weapons and placements were almost all new equipment. There were even spare parts for everything. Han had ceased to wonder how much it had all cost. The New Republic had paid for it all. He'd never even seen a bill. Sitting in the pilot's seat in the cockpit, he initiated the launch sequence. He didn't really intend to take the ship up. He just, he just wanted to look at the sky. The dome above the Falcon split in two, slid slowly apart as the platform the Falcon rested on raised itself up and the sky came out. Han Solo stared out at the world. It was amazing how much better it made him feel just to be sitting there in the closest thing to a home that he had ever had. The seat next to him was empty, and that wasn't right. But it wasn't entirely wrong, either. He hadn't met Chewbacca until well into his adult years. And there had been a time before that, before Chewie, after the death of his parents, when there had been nobody. No one except himself. Han wondered sometimes, rarely, to be sure, what his family would have thought about him, if they could have seen what he had grown into. He had never had to wonder about it when he was younger. His family had loved him, but... He knew that he had been a disappointment to them. They had not lived to see him grow into anything better. You can pinpoint moments when change occurs. Not always. Some changes are like the tide, slow and barely perceptible until they've come and gone. Sometimes, though? Han did think about this, and with oddly increasing frequency as the event itself grew more distant in time, the Death Star was coming, and it was going to destroy the rebel base, the rebels themselves and their plainly doomed rebellion. Han had taken Chewie and the Falcon and gotten out with time to spare. Chewie was furious. Han could tell. Chewie wanted to fight. They'd sat here, together, in the Falcon's control room, with Chewie not talking to him. Han had not made one, but two errors calculating the jump to hyperspace. Finally, he had his trajectory and he hadn't been able to run it. All right, all right, let's go fight, he yelled at Chewie finally almost 20 years ago, convinced they were both heading to their deaths. He sat in the cockpit of the Falcon almost 20 years later and wondered what might have been. Leia would have been dead, and so would Luke. His children would never have been born. The Empire would still rule the galaxy, and he and Chewie would be traveling from world to world one step ahead of the Imperials one step ahead of the bounty hunters. No, thought Han, not one step. Someone would have caught me. Boba Fett, IG-88, someone. And I'd have had no friends to come and rescue me from Jabba. Twenty years. To this day, Han could remember with perfect clarity how close he had come to punching in that trajectory and leaving Leia and Luke behind. He woke up at night sometimes in cold sweats thinking about it. How very close. If his parents were still alive, Han thought they'd be impressed by the man he'd grown into, and not the least bit surprised at how close it had come to not happening. Mariha and Dona tapped a stud when the hail came. This is Control. This is General Solo. Mariha grimaced at the use of the title. Solo was certainly entitled to it, but Maria had been running flight control over this sector of Coruscant long enough to know that Solo only used it when he was going to be pushy about something. I'm going to take the Falcon up for a bit. Any chance I could get you to pipe me a flight path? Yes, sir. What is your destination? I haven't got one. Maria said calmly, Excuse me, sir. I don't have one. I don't know where I'm going yet. Mariha sighed, looking across the screens that showed all the flights in her sector. There were so many of them that it was hard for a human to pick out any single blip as belonging to an individual ship. She thought, the flight droid is going to pitch a fit. The flight droid always pitched a fit. It had acquired a dislike for General Solo many years ago when- Which part of this are you having difficulty with, Control? I'm going to need a couple minutes, she muttered into the comm unit. The flight droid doesn't like you. You need, said Solo, to clear a corridor and give me a flight path, and do it now before I've got to go down to the tower personally and charm you to death. Do you copy that? 
I copy you, General. She finished composing his request for clearance and punched it in, and then sat there punching override over and over and over again at the flight droid's objections. And here you go. Have a nice trip, General. Don't hurry back. Try not to miss me too much, sweetheart. Pleasure as usual. Solo out. Not long after that, her supervisor's hollow sprung into existence, one-sixth sized in the viewing area off her right. This is most irregular, he said severely. Did General Solo give you a flight plan? Nope. Estimated time of return? Nuh-uh. It was almost a shriek. Destination? Couldn't tell you. Nowhere in system, though. He entered hyperspace about 20 minutes ago. Strange things happen in the course of a lifetime. When he started out his career as a bounty hunter, Boba Fett had never even heard of the place. Tatooine. But that small and meaningless desert planet, as it turned out, became a part of Fett's life, and over the course of the years kept intruding back into it. Jabba the Hutt had established his headquarters there. Luke Skywalker, Fett learned many years later, had actually grown up on Tatooine. The worst disaster of his life had taken place there, his fall into the great pit of Carcoon, into the maw of the Sarlacc. Two years ago, Tatooine had intruded into Fett's life again. Four mercs, two of them Deveronian, had walked into a bar in Mos Eisley. One of the Deveronian mercs recognized, or thought he had recognized, the butcher of Montelli and Surratt. The identification might not have been accurate. The old Deveronian he had pointed to had promptly killed all four of the mercs, and no one was able to question him about it. The old Deveronian had vanished, clean off Tatooine, and Fett had tracked him. Here, to Papel, a world almost as far away from Coruscant as Tatooine. The target? Cardu Sai Malach, the butcher of Montellian Surat. There was a five million credit bounty on the butcher, five million credits of retirement money. Boba Fett was not the man he had once been. His right leg from the knee down was artificial. Only constant medical treatment kept him from developing cancer. The days he had spent in the belly of the Sarlacc had altered his metabolism permanently, had damaged him genetically to such a degree he could not have children had he wanted them. His cellular structure did not always regenerate the way they were meant to. To say nothing of the memories he had carried away from the Sarlacc and the Sarlacc's genetic soup, memories that were not always his own. Fett waited on his belly in the cold, in the mud, nude except for the shorts that had kept his privates decently covered, with arrows in a quiver slung across his back and a bow in one hand, and a crystal knife inside a leather sheath. Malloc, or Labria, the name he had been going by for the last couple of decades now, was trickier than more dangerous than anyone he had ever dreamed of. He had a reputation in Mos Eisley. Fett had learned Labria was the worst spy in the city. He was a drunk, and nobody respected him or feared him, until the day he killed four mercs in the prime of their lives. Darkness gathered. Fett waited, shivering, worrying. Artificial light of some sort glimmered in the hut's sole window. The metal content of his artificial leg was low, but Fett did not know how good the butcher's security system was. All he knew was that it was there. He had slipped tripwires, light traps, and crawled centimeter by centimeter past blinking motion sensors. If there were not some sort of sensor sweeping the clearing, Fett would have been surprised. It was the reason he had not worn his armor, nor brought more modern weapons. The lights in the hut went out. The hut had no plumbing. The previous night at this time, Malak had waited several minutes after extinguishing his light, letting his eyes acclimate to the darkness, Fett assumed, before coming outside. Fett reached over his back, pulled an arrow free, and strung the bow. It was a compound bow that required the least exertion after it had been pulled back. Fett pulled it and waited. Last night, this time, Malak had come out outside to relieve himself. Fett didn't know much about Deveronians as he might have. Though he had studied an anatomy chart for Deveronians, he didn't want to shoot the fellow in the wrong place. Conceivably, they only relieved themselves once a week. If so, he was going to have to think of some other approach. The door swung open. 
and the bounty stood in the doorway, assault rifle cradled in both hands, took a quick step outside onto the porch and then stepped off the porch and walked around the side of the house near Fett's hiding place. Fett tracked Malak as he moved over the open-air toilet that Devronian had dug for himself, ten meters outside the hut. He waited for Malak to disrobe and relieve himself, and then waited until he was done and pulling his clothing back together again. He needed to keep this one alive, and Fett had shot too many individuals of all species to shoot anyone before he, she, or it had emptied itself. Someone always had to clean up after it, and usually that was the person who wasn't in chains. Fett let the fellow stand up from the toilet, turning away from Fett and shot Malak high in the back. He was on his feet and running, in a half-stagger himself, running on legs that shrieked in pain as Malak stumbled forward, giving voice to something that managed to mix a scream and a roar. Fett closed on Malak, and Fett rolled down to get low, and with the knife slashed Malak across the hamstrings of his right leg. Malak fell forward to his knees, still reaching up trying to pull the arrow free from his shoulder. Fett pushed him forward against the hut's wall grabbed Malak by one of his horns and pulled his head back and got the knife to his throat. Move and you die, he whispered harshly. The hut reeked. The butcher of Montellian Surat, Cardu Sai Malak, sat propped up against the wall, the arrow pulled from his back but the wound still bleeding, and strained against the bonds that kept his hands pulled behind his back. The hut was spacious. The hut's size was one of the things that had given Fett pause. He'd wondered what the butcher was hiding inside it. Mostly wondered what weapons might be tucked away inside there, waiting for the wrong person. There were no weapons, though, except for the rifle the butcher carried with him. Fett had known the Devronians were carnivores. Had he not known it, the contents of the hut would have confirmed it. The slaughtered carcasses of half a dozen animals hung across the far wall. A corner of the room had a pile of bones and shells in it, stripped almost clean of flesh. Dozens of empty bottles were scattered among them, and the opposite corner was the pit where Malak had slept, and another several dozen bottles, still full of maranzanine gold, lined up along the floorboards next to the pit. Fett had not bothered to look at anything yet except the controls for the security system. As far as he could tell, it was a passive security, nothing that would shoot at the Slave 4 had he brought it down to a landing in the clearing a few kilometers back along the trail. Finally, satisfied, he sat back and turned to his bounty. On your feet. We're going to walk a bit. I had to leave the call back outside range of your sensors. Malak grimaced, showing sharp teeth. He was a large for Deveronian, which made him very large for a human. He spoke in basic with less accent than Fett's own. No, I don't think I will. Fett hefted the man's own assault rifle. He shrugged. Devronians are tough. I know that about you. You do not go into shock, and you do not die easily. You will walk while I'll burn off your arms and your legs to make you lighter, and then I will drag you to where we are going. Fett paused. Your choice. The bounty sighed wearily. Kill me. I'm not walking. I'll do worse than kill you, Fett said patiently. His left knee was paining him. His entire right leg was on fire from the prosthesis upward, and he really didn't want to drag this very large Devronian two kilometers, not even after lightening him. Malak let his head fall back to the wall behind him. Do you know what you're doing, bounty hunter? Do you even know who I am? Fett fired a quick burst into the wall near Malak's head to get his attention. It did no more than singe the damp wooden wallboards. Listen, I am Boba Fett. It had been a generation since one of his bounties had failed to recognize the name. It brought this fellow's eyes alive. Fear, Fett assumed. And you are Cardu Saimalak. The butcher of Montellian Sarat. You are worth five million credits alive and nothing dead. So you will not annoy me into killing you. Boba Fett, he whispered. He stared up into Fett's face. <laughs> You're an ugly piece of prey. 
I heard you were after me. Fett couldn't believe how much talking he was having to do to keep from dragging this fellow two clicks. Yes, now do I burn your... They say you're honest. That was an opening for a negotiation if Fett had ever heard one. What do you have? Something worth trading five million credits for? Malak stared at Fett, searching his features for... Fett could not imagine what. He took a breath, winced, and then nodded. Yes, by the cold I do. Something worth five million credits, easy. Maybe more. Something priceless, Fett. Fett said impatiently, What? Kang, Malik whispered. Maxa Jandavar. Janet Lalasha. Miracle Miriko. The last name Fett recognized and knew the idiot was lying. Miriko died in Imperial custody 25 years ago, you lying fool. And the bounty on him was 20,000 credits, not any five mil. Music! Malak yelled. He glared at Fett. You uncivilized barbarian music! I have the music of Maxa Jandavar and Oren Mersai. Larnak Cambric. He took a deep breath and yelled again. Lubrix! Ashara! Dial! Fett shook his head wearily. No. No, I don't care about your music. Now will you get up, or must I carve you up and drag you? The butcher leaned his head back and stared up at the roof. The light caught his predator's eyes and glimmered back out of them. By the cold, he whispered. But you're ignorant. Even for a human, you're ignorant. There are people who will pay for that music, Fett. I have the only recordings left of half a dozen of the galaxy's finest musicians. The Empire killed the musicians, destroyed their music. Five million credits, said Fett politely. The butcher hesitated a second too long. More than that. Fett pointed the rifle at the butcher's legs. Negotiation is over. I will drag you if you make me. And he was not joking. Malak closed his eyes and spoke a bare moment before Fett had decided to start cutting. I'll walk. But you have to make me three promises. You dig up my music chips. They're buried in a holding case under a few centimeters of dirt out back. After you deliver me to the Devroon, you take those chips to the person I tell you to take them to, and you sell them to her for whatever she can offer. And finally, he nodded towards the bottles of golden liquor. We take six of those with us. I'm going to need them. He saw Fett shaking his head and said sharply, this is not a negotiation, ignorant human. You start shooting if you think it is, but I warn you, I'll do my level best to die on you between here and Devaroon. I have a mean streak in me, bounty hunter. Bounty hunting, thought Boba Fett wearily, is not what it used to be. He waved the rifle at Malak. Fine. Agreed. Get up and show me where your blasted music is buried. Welcome to death, gentlemen Morgavi. What do you have to declare? As was so frequently the case anymore, at least when dealing with other humans, the customs agent standing before Han Solo in the bright Jubilar sunshine seemed... Well, he struck Han as younger than Luke Skywalker had seemed the first time Han had seen him. A grin touched Han. He couldn't help it. No, nothing to declare. The boy looked at the falcon, then back at Han. Suspicion worked across his face like a baby negotiating his first steps. Nothing? he asked finally. Despite his best instincts, Han's grin grew larger. Sorry, no. I just came to Jubilar for a visit. The kid thought he was a smuggler. I'll just head over to the port bar, he said. I expect you want to search the ship right about now. The grin appeared to be offending the customs man. Yes, sir. Why don't you just wait in the bar um, while we search? Of course, if you're in a hurry... The man paused. Han Solo tried to remember the last time he had bribed a customs official, 
and couldn't. I haven't smuggled anything since, well, practically since before the rebellion, said Han. He headed off towards the main terminal, turned back for a moment. There are cargo holds right underneath the main deck. I left them unlocked, although. Don't break anything trying to get into them, okay? The customs agent stared at him. I'll have a beer, said Han. Corellian, if you got it. The port bar was nearly empty. Only a few elderly Gamorians sat together in the booth in the back, playing some game that involved throwing bones. A creature of some race Han had never seen before sat at the far end of the bar hop, inhaling something that, even from here, reeked of ammonia. The bartender looked Han over and nodded, and turned toward the bar. A long mirror hung on the wall behind the bar. Han stared at himself in it. He thought that the gray in his hair gave him a distinguished look. I thought the city was called Dying Slowly, Han said as a dark beer was laid down in front of him. When did the name change? The bartender shrugged. It's always been just death, as far as I know. How long you been on planet? Eight years. What for? The bartender stared at him. Take some advice. You don't ask that sort of question around here. He shook his head and turned away. Han nodded and sought drinking his beer. He had known that once. A thought struck him. Hey, buddy! The bartender looked over at him. Just out of curiosity, said Han. He paused and looked around the nearly empty mid-afternoon bar. He leaned back in toward the bartender. Now that spice is legal here, what sorts of things get smuggled around here these days? The trip to Deveron took long enough that Malak's shoulder wound was nearly healed by the time they neared hyperspace breakout. Though the leg was starting to fester and none of the drugs Fett had seemed to be helping, Fett hoped sincerely that the injury wouldn't kill the fellow before they reached Deveron. Fett had sent a communication ahead to the Bounty Hunters Guild. Normally he would not have bothered to involve the guild, but normally he didn't have a five million credit bounty. A guild representative would be waiting at the Deverone when they reached it. Fett kept the butcher down on Slave 4's holding room through most of the trip. In the remaining minutes left before their exit from hyperspace, Fett dressed himself. The Mandalorian combat armor he dressed in was not the armor he had worn in years past. That armor had burned and cracked and was still somewhere deep inside the great pit of Carcoon, back on Tatooine. But Mandalorian combat armor, though rare, could still be acquired if you went about it right. For years, Fett had been hearing about another bounty hunter who wore Mandalorian combat armor, a fellow named Jodo Cast. It had annoyed him terribly. With some frequency during those years, Fett had found himself being blamed for, and credited with, things Cast had done. Less than a year after his escape from the Sarlacc, Fett had hunted Jodo Cast down via the Bounty Hunters Guild. He pretended to be a client, disguised in bandages. His own guild had not known him. He had requested the services of Cast, and Cast had come. By that time, Fett had changed into his own spare armor, taken away the imposter's armor, and also his life. Before the ship left hyperspace, Fett brought the butcher up to the control room and put him in the nearest chair closest to the airlock. Malak was sweating heavily, fighting with his fear. He had drunk his first five bottles early in the trip. Fett had held back the sixth bottle for this moment. Fett restrained Malak at the ankles, and by his right hand, he left the Deveronian's left hand unchained so that Malak might drink. Once he was satisfied with Malak's bonds, Fett unsealed and handed Malak the last bottle of Maranzane gold. It wasn't a matter of kindness on Fett's part. If it kept Malak from struggling during the transfer to the Deveronian authorities, better to let him drink. They had barely spoken to one another the entire trip. Malak lifted the bottle to his lips and swallowed three, four times before speaking. How much longer? Six minutes before breakout. At least twenty before we dock with a shuttle that'll take you downside. He paused. Time enough for you to finish the bottle if you work at it. Do you know what they're going to do to me? They will feed you, still alive, 
to a pack of starved quora. Fett paused. Domesticated hunting animals. This practice is one of the things that has kept Deveron out of the New Republic, I've heard. Malak nodded a little convulsively, then took another drink. It's a bad way to die. I saw it done once when I was a little boy. You were right, Fett. We Deveronians don't die easily. The Quora go for the belly first, the soft flesh. But then the Condemned doesn't die of that. They may nibble on your ears or your eyes or your horns, but that won't kill you either. If you're lucky, the Quora will tear out your throat quickly. You arch your head back and expose your throat, and if you're lucky... you saw it done, said Fett curiously. What had the Condemned done? Malloc stared at the golden liquid in his free hand and took another drink. I don't think there's a word for it exactly in basic. He went hunting during a famine and caught his prey and fed himself and his quora. He didn't bring any back to the tribe. He looked up at Fett. Do you know what I did? Fett glanced over at his instruments. Several minutes left until breakout. Best to let him talk. He looked back at Malloc. Yes. I was a good servant for the Empire, said the Butcher. My own people rose in rebellion. They sent my command out to hunt them down. And I did, Fett. I hunted them across the Northlands and I caught them in the city of Montellian Serat. We shelled them until they surrendered. Fett nodded. And after taking your surrender, you executed them. Seven hundred of them. The Empire ordered us to move on. To reinforce loyal troops, fighting just south of us, we were not to leave any troops behind as guards for the prisoners. And certainly we were not to leave any of them living. They didn't tell you to execute the prisoners. They didn't have to. Malik drank again, a huge belt, lowering the level of the bottle noticeably. It took almost five minutes, Vet. We put them in a holding pen and just started shooting at them. They screamed and screamed and screamed. We just kept shooting until the screaming had stopped, he said almost pleadingly. I was following orders. I know. They say you were Darth Vader's favorite bounty hunter. Yes. Don't you have any loyalty to what you were? A touch of real anger glittered through Malak's despair. I did the Empire's work, man. Doesn't that count for anything? Fett thought about it. I wish, he said finally, that the Empire had not fallen. He nodded, remembering, then said softly, Yes, I used to enjoy my work more. Hopelessness settled on the Butcher. He sagged, looking as though someone had just doubled the artificial gravity in the Slave 4. They always thought they could bargain, or plead, right up till the last moment. Malloc hadn't actually had a chance to ask the next question. He asked it now. Virtually all of Fett's bounties given the chance did. How did you catch me? A minute left to break out. Fett nodded towards the bottle Malloc had. I traced the sails of Merenzane Gold across the entire sector Tatooine is in. They said at the bar you frequented on Tatooine that it was your favorite drink. Malak stared at him. That crap I drank on Tatooine? That wasn't Merenzane Gold, you idiot! They don't serve Merenzane Gold in bars like that. They just pour it out of bottles that once, eons ago, were looked at hard by a man who'd even heard of Merenzane. Don't you know anything about liquor? He asked in despair. Haven't you a single civilized vice? Fett shook his head. No, I do not drink, nor indulge in other drugs. They are an insult to the flesh. So you hunted me down because you thought I was drinking Maranzane gold all those years on tattooing. Fett I had one glass of real gold the entire time I was on that miserable excuse of a world. Malloc shook his head in disbelief, took another swig from the bottle. 
by the cold, I can't believe I got caught by a nerf herder like you. The hyperspace tunnel fragmented around them. Fett turned away from Malak to his controls. Reality, Fett said, doesn't care if you believe it. Malak threw the bottle, of course. The security system shot it out of the air with a single blaster bolt. The bottle blew apart into shards that rattled against the back of Fett's helmet. The liquid splashed against Fett's armor. You should have drunk it, Fett said. He did not have to look at Malak to know the gray despair that crossed his features. He had seen it before a thousand times. Fett docked with the shuttle in orbit around Deveron. The guild representative came across first. Fett stood in the main entryway, rifle in hand, pointing it at the representative as he entered. The representative was Bill Mendowd, a human, tall and thin and elderly, with a severe bearing and no discernible sense of humor. He had been in the guild even longer than Fett, which was a remarkable accomplishment in this day and age. Hunter Fett, he said, courteously enough. Dowd. Dowd looked the butcher over. Cardu Saimalak sat motionlessly, staring straight ahead. He did not seem to be aware of Dowd's presence. This is the butcher, is it? I believe so. Dowd nodded. He carried with him a small slate with various controls on it. He touched one now and spoke. Come across. The Slave Four's lock cycled again. Four Deveronians entered, two of them in military dress, bearing rifles that they carried pointed at the Slave Four's loading deck. The third was a female Deveronian, young, in gold robes and a gold headdress, the fourth wearing robes of a cut similar to the woman's, except in black, and was an older Deveronian, perhaps the butcher's age. All four hesitated at the sight of Fett, aiming his rifle at them. Dowd gestured to the woman and said something in Deveronian. Fett had never actually heard the language spoken before. It was low and guttural and full of snarling consonants. It sounded like an invitation to a fight. The woman's expression did not change. She crossed to the spot where Malok sat. Fett had restrained his left hand prior to allowing anyone else on board. She kneeled in front of Malok, looking the shivering prisoner over as though she were inspecting a carcass in the marketplace. Malok's skin had acquired a blue tinge. Fett supposed that is something that happened to a Deveronian when they were deathly afraid. The woman stood up and nodded abruptly. She spoke in Deveronian. Dowd said, She says it's her father. Fett nodded. It was the reason the bounty had to be alive rather than dead or alive. It had only changed a few years back. The Deveronians had no longer been certain that the Butcher would be recognizable dead. The older Deveronian said grimly, in rather poor basic, We pay him now. Dowd handed the tablet over to the Deveronian. The Deveronian laid his hand flat against the tablet and spoke several words in Deveronian. Dowd took the panel back, tapped two of the controls in succession, and turned to Fett. You've been paid. It was not the sort of thing Fett took anyone's word for. He took several steps backwards, rifle still pointed at the group, and glanced slightly to the side. In the hollow field at the edge of the control panel, a live link to the guild bank showed the current balance in Fett's numbered account. 4,507,303 credits. 5 million credits, less the guild's handling fee of 10%, plus... 7,303 credits Fett had in the account. Business had been bad in recent years. The relief that washed over Fett at the sight was the strongest emotion other than anger that he had felt in at least a decade. He could afford to have a replacement clone for his lower right leg. He could afford the cancer treatments that had been bankrupting him. Fett barely heard himself say, Take him. He's yours. They hauled the butcher up out of the chair he was restrained in, being none too gentle with him. As they pulled him to his feet, he yelled at Fett and Basic, You do what you promised! The glare in his eyes was perfectly mad. 
as they dragged him towards the airlock. You take care of my music! After the Deveronians had gone, Dowd stood with his tablet looking at Fett with plain curiosity. Fett sat in the pilot's seat, still holding his rifle, pointed rather generally in Dowd's direction. Dowd said, You'll be retiring, I presume? Fett shrugged. I haven't thought about it. Dowd nodded. What did he mean about the music? He had a music collection. Music the Empire suppressed, apparently. He asked me to deliver it to a woman who would see that the music was published. Are you going to? Dowd lifted an eyebrow. I said I would. Dowd nodded. You're a strange one. The comment didn't offend Fett. Dowd had made the observation before and more than once over the course of the decades they had known each other. Dowd reached into the pocket of his coat, and Fett stirred, bringing the rifle up slightly. Dowd's smile was thin. I have a message, Chip, for you. Message that arrived at Guild Headquarters. Do you want it? Leave it on the deck, Fett said. And leave. I'm very tired. The message was amazing. The encryption code was so old that Fett had to dig into his computer archives to find the key for it. He'd made the practice over the years of giving his informants encryption codes with a numbered sequence. The first five digits of his message were 00802, which made it at least 25 years old. Fett's current encryption identification number started well upwards of 12,000. He unarchived the encryption key for the 0802 protocol and decoded the message. It was short. It said, Han Solo is on Jubilar. In Kavi Larado. In a lifetime of bounty hunting, Boba Fett had rarely, in conversation with others, said two words when one would do. He didn't talk to himself. Not ever. Boba Fett said out loud, On his way to Jubilar, Boba Fett played the music that the Butcher of Montelli and Surratt had thought more important than his life. There were over 500 info chips in the carrying case the Butcher had buried. Each chip had the capacity to hold about a day's worth of music. Fett opened the case, pulled one free at random, and plugged it in. The sounds that surrounded him were different, he had to admit. Atonal, crashing, and thoroughly unpleasant to the ear. He shook his head and pulled the chip free and decided to try one more. A long silence after the chip was inserted. Fett waited and finally, impatiently, reached for it. The sound tugged at the limits of audibility. Fett froze in the motion of reaching for the chip, straining to hear. The whisper grew into the faintest sound of a woodwind, and then a high horn joined it, playing counterpoint. Fett's hand dropped and he leaned back in his chair and listened. A voice that sounded female to Fett, but might have been a human male or an alien of any of a dozen sexes, for all Fett could have sworn to, joined in, weaving in and among the instruments, singing beautifully in a language that meant nothing to Fett, a language that he had never heard before. After a bit, he reached up and pulled his helmet off. Lights off, he said. A while later, he sat there in the cool cabin on his way to Jubilar to kill Han Solo, listening in the darkness to the only copy anywhere in the galaxy of the legendary Brulian Dill's last concert. In the icy Deveronian Northlands beneath the dark blue skies that had haunted Cardu Simalok's dreams for over two decades, some 10,000 Deveronians had converged in the judgment field outside the ruins of the ancient holy city of Montelli and Surat. The city, Malak, had shelled into its current state. It was a beautiful day late in the cold season, with a chill breeze out of the north, and high pale clouds skidding across the darkened skies. The sun hung low on the southern horizon. The blue mountains lifted away up to the north. 
Malak barely noticed the Devronians surrounding him. The members of his family dressed in their robes of mourning as they pushed him through the crowds to the pit where the quarrel waited. He heard the quarrel growl, heard the growl rising as he grew closer to the pit. His daughter and brother walked a few bare steps behind him. Malak recalled he had once had a wife. He wondered why she was not there. Perhaps she had died. A dozen quora in the pit, lean and hungry, leaped up towards the spot where Malak's guards brought him to a halt. The Veronians are not creatures of ceremony. A herald cried out, The Butcher of Montelian Serat! And the screams of the crowd raised up and surrounded Malak in an immense roar that drowned out the noise of the snarling quora. The bonds that held him were released and strong young hands shoved him forward and into the pit where the starving Quora waited. The Quora leapt and had their teeth in him before he reached the ground. He could see the blue mountains from where he fell. He had almost forgotten the mountains, the forests, all those years on that desert world. Oh, but the trees were beautiful. Arch your head back. 